In 2022, confidence in Parliament and Government reached a historic low. In surveys carried out by King's College London, only 23% of participants in the survey expressed confidence in Parliament, and confidence in Government was at roughly the same level. Not a surprise to those with an interest in politics. In the same survey, confidence in British political parties was exceptionally low at 13%. In the 2019 general election, the British people were given a choice between Jeremy Corbyn and Boris Johnson. Corbyn led the Labour Party to their worst defeat in decades. While the Tories gained a large majority, Johnson only lasted three years as the Conservative Party leader. He was followed by Liz Truss, who was elected by the Conservative Party membership. But she lasted just 49 days, and was the shortest serving Prime Minister this country has ever had. Should it occur to someone that getting involved in politics is a way of contributing something to society, then a look at what's been going on over the past few years would be enough to put most people off. And it seems it has. The decline of party membership, occasionally boosted by politicians who could at best be described as disingenuous, has left weaknesses in the parties that have allowed individuals who should be unelectable to rise to the top of their parties. There's nothing new about this, but there's usually been a core of good, hard-working people in the parties who have hauled their party back towards electability after it's gone astray. The problem for the public is that it shouldn't be necessary. We're paying politicians to do the job properly all of the time, not just some of the time. The only solution to these problems is to make sure the membership of the political parties in Parliament reflect the views and standards of the decent majority of the British people. And that means more of us getting involved in the political system. As pointed out in an earlier video, this is something that 99% of us don't want to do. But as we now know, things are going to change. That change creates enormous opportunities for making Parliament better represent the people of Britain. There are a lot of good people in the political parties already, but there need to be more. The introduction of Campaign for Democracy systems should lead to a huge increase in party membership. And this in turn, should lead to an increase in the experience and expertise of those available to serve in Parliament. But are there other barriers that might exclude people who have much to contribute? One barrier, and it's a contentious one, is politicians' pay. It's often said that if you want better people in Parliament, we're going to have to pay them more. And that's politically difficult, as there's probably quite a few voters who are thinking that some MPs aren't worth the money they're already getting paid. There's some truth in that, but what if MPs' pay was linked to their earnings prior to becoming an MP? That would mean that some MPs would be getting paid more than others, but to put it bluntly, some are worth more than others. What would happen if this change was put into place, linkage but with a minimum and a maximum level set? With new systems of government in place and greatly increased party membership, we can expect the number of people who would be interested in being prospective parliamentary candidates to rise sharply. We can also expect more care in the selection of candidates from that larger and wiser party membership. A membership that will have undergone a shift in political culture as we change from being subjects to being citizens. This should increase the likelihood of good candidates being selected, something that will encourage good people to put themselves forward. Amongst those who might be interested in getting more involved, will be some who can't do politics full-time because they need to continue in their profession to ensure the continuity of experience and expertise that makes them employable. In many jobs, a break from work of more than two years is seen as making a person unemployable due to an inevitable decline in knowledge and skill. Few in that situation are going to give a career in politics a second glance, especially when it's borne in mind how precarious being an MP can be. But there are many people outside politics who have much to contribute to the breadth and depth needed in the creation of legislation. Much of the experience needed does exist in Parliament, but it's not in the House of Commons, it's in the House of Lords, and some of it comes from those who only attend part-time and who only get paid for the days they attend. Many members of the House of Lords are political appointments, but there are also those who have been appointed because of their expertise and experience often gained through their profession. About 20% of members across benches are appointed because they have specialist knowledge or experience to contribute to the debates. Here's a recording from a parliamentary committee 
looking into the membership of the House of Lords. The speaker is Lord Philip Norton, who is a Professor of Government at the University of Hull. Actually this morning, I, as an exercise, I actually got our members' photo book to just randomly look, so I just opened it at the, the middle, which happened to be women crossbench peers. And that gives you some idea of the flavour of those who are appointed. So Baroness Hollins is a professor of psychiatry. Uh, Tanny Gray-Thompson, Baroness Gray-Thompson, the Paralympian. Uh, Baroness Teach, of course, you, you've seen because, uh, for the pre-appointment hearing, a very distinguished uh, lawyer, Baroness Finley of Landaff, professor of uh, palliative care. Baroness Butler Sloss, who, of course, was the first woman Lord Justice of appeal uh, president of the family division of the high court the largely responsible for the human rights uh, act baroness brown of cambridge who's an engineer um uh, late baroness boothroyd of course um so that just gives you a flavor um of some of the ones uh, there's baroness hogg who was the first chair of a FTSE 100 company um baroness casey who's well known for her inquiry into homelessness and then the culture of the metropolitan police following the sarah everard case yeah. so that gives you an idea that's just to illustrate well, the what we should be working towards and as the norm here's another one that gives you some idea of how much experience is available in the house of lords so for example last week we had the second reading uh of the investigatory, investigatory Powers Amendment Bill, well, Lord Anderson of Ipswich spoke, former independent reviewer of terrorism legislation, whose independent review earlier this year gave rise to the bill. Um, so, uh, and we, we also had two former members of, uh, two former heads of MI5 speak. So you... Some might question whether or not these peers have an impact, but this video clip from the same committee makes it clear that they do make a difference with the amendments to the legislation they make when bills reach the House of Lords. Here's Professor Meg Russell of University College London speaking to the same committee. I'm uh, due to be writing a small piece on the um, levelling up and regeneration bill, uh, which has obviously just gone through. There was quite a lot of controversy in the Commons on that bill. Um, there were um, 95 amendments in the Commons, most of them at report as a result of government concessions. Um, but then in the House of Lords, there were a further 424 government-sponsored amendments. So the it's clear that the contributions made in the House of Lords have greatly improved the legislation, and these changes have been supported by the government to put the legislation forward. What is interesting is that many members making these contributions only attend part-time. At the moment you have some people who are still, like some of those that Philip mentioned perhaps, um, who are still active in their professions um, and they bring that expertise into the House. And then you have many people of course who are retired, um, who don't wish to contribute full-time anymore but who have a wealth of experience and that includes people who've retired from this place. Um, it has in the past one of the things about David Cameron's appointment that I rather like is that it's brought a former Prime Minister mm. back yeah. to the Lords for the first time since Margaret Thatcher died 10 years ago. I mean, it used to be commonplace, it used to be the norm that Prime Ministers would be appointed, like <coughs> Speakers of the House, would be appointed to the Lords when they left this place. And if they turn up occasionally um, and make contributions, and I think that's valuable. I think, I think a mix of people who are full-time and of people who are more expert and contribute perhaps less maybe because they're uh, because they're older is actually quite a healthy thing yes. myself no i think we recognize that in the creation of the house the value of having members who if you like come in who've got the day jobs their areas of expertise the value is the expertise is current there is a set, set here's more on that subject from both philip norton and meg russell so having those who are at the forefront of their particular field who can then come in and contribute to that I think is extremely valuable. We recognise that, we benefit from it. That's one of the arguments against having the, the House as too small a body, a small body of full-time members. But we don't want it to be too large, we recognise we are too large. But focusing on the Prime Ministers, I think you may need two ways of looking at it. Um, that there is a there's a general sort of maybe minimum level of participation for I don't I mean I don't know quite how you square it but I would see it almost as two different routes that there are some people who are put in there because of real sort of 
very high achievement and who you appreciate may contribute you know a, a couple of times a year and that this is valuable uh, but then that the, the great majority of people who go in ought to be going in to do a job and contributing very substantially I don't know how quite how you... the House of Lords gives us an example of how expertise from those working outside Parliament can be included through an appointment system but are there other ways the way the Swiss federal government works gives us another option. The main part of the two-chamber Swiss government is the 200-member National Council, the equivalent of our House of Commons. What's unusual about the members of the National Council is that they're part-timers. The National Council meets for about three weeks in every three months, so in theory they've all got proper jobs outside politics. They're connected to the real world. It sounds good, however, in practice, about half of them are full-time politicians and the other half spend around half their time on political activities. But it does show that politicians don't have to be full-time. In the House of Lords, we've seen how unelected individuals with expertise can contribute. And while some object to this lack of election, it's important to remember that the House of Lords can't create law. All the members of the House of Lords can do is comment and delay, although in practice the Lords recognise that their unelected status means that the power to delay should not be used. If they're not elected, what makes them legitimate? Well, what legitimises the Lords, under the current system, is that they can and do contribute to improving legislation. And most importantly, they are subordinate to the House of Commons. It's a bit of a bodge, but it works. What matters is that the Lords can have a direct impact, because they can talk directly to government. What they have to say doesn't have to go through filters, like parliamentary committees, who can water down or discard their message. As members of the House of Lords, they can speak directly to the people in government who are responsible for getting the legislation through. You could argue that the legislation coming out of the House of Commons should be much better than it is. It shouldn't need amending, and of course that's true. But that's not our starting point. We are where we are, so let's learn what we can from that experience. So what am I suggesting we do? I'm not suggesting anything. My job is to give you examples of problems, examples of solutions, and to put into place a reform process that allows you to decide for yourselves what systems of government you want. I'm giving you the chance to look around the world, see what works and what doesn't, and bring the best back to Wales.